live. There we go. Well, welcome everybody. We have some people sitting in these chairs already. We're very excited. We're doing a wonderful, very thought-provoking seminar tonight on the true definition of beauty. And I think everyone's really going to enjoy this. Um, so we're just getting ourselves together here. I see Guy has come. That's great. Everyone have a seat in the um, seminar room. You'll see it uh, just on your left when you come in and have a seat in the chairs. We think it's really nice. All the women are very ladylike and they have their legs crossed. And <laughs> the men, we have our legs straight straight out. Just so funny the way that uh, spatial is setting these things. But obviously your mom's taught you well. So that's nice. <laughs> uh, we have pictures up on the wall. Um, we're going to start with the seminar here in another three minutes, and then uh, we'll go up to the dance floor and we can hang out, do a little dancing. And uh, then we actually have a, a hot tub that we can go into and I can answer questions from the audience, that kind of thing. So um, very, very excited about our talk tonight. This is our first, you know, big time really going into um, talk about the true definition of beauty, our first big seminar here. Um, and um be cool we'll get some nice pictures here too as we go along yeah come on in have a seat um have a seat in the uh seminar room there i see someone trying to come in have a seat in one of the chairs there Didi, awesome oh you gotta pick your own chair i think you're sitting on someone right there <laughs> you have like duplicate people there and key has come as well this is nice okay we've got two minutes too and uh i'm excited for everyone uh, being here tonight we're gonna have a great time you're going to learn some things and some really interesting ideas on how our subconscious brain actually works. Um, so I think you're going to find that really interesting. That's very cool examples to show you that. Um, and then um, I'm going to teach you a little bit about uh, um, our skin and how our skin ages and what the sun does to us. So it's a pretty comprehensive talk. You're going to walk away with a lot of knowledge here. Um, everyone, come on in. Have a seat in the... Um, in the seminar room, just pick a chair. You can sit near the fish tank if you want. Um, you can sit in the front, you can sit in the middle row there. Just come on in here, have a seat. Uh, we're getting started in another minute or so. You guys look so, everyone looks so good, I tell you. I'm really impressed uh, with the view of everybody here. This is wonderful. Come on in, I see someone over there. Come on in and join us here in the uh, in the media room here. In the seminar room, just have a seat there. Come on in and join us. We're starting um, just in one minute here, uh, the whole talk about the uh, true definition of beauty. And there's going to be some nice offers for everyone at the very end here as well. So I'm glad that everyone's uh, come in and to join us. We're going to learn a lot today. Oh, thanks for the hearts. That's really nice. And Alan Christo, come on in. Alan, come on in. Have a seat uh, in one of the chairs here in the media room. Alan, I see you came in. So have a seat in the a media, uh, the seminar room here. Uh, there's many seats here, and are we getting started uh, just in about 30 seconds? We're starting our uh, our seminar, our first uh, real big seminar here in the uh, Metaverse place. Okay, it is now seven o'clock. Uh, we're going to start. So I want to welcome everybody here to uh, my uh, penthouse. Uh, this is actually a penthouse um, that's set in an island off of Australia, uh, and it's called uh, French Polynesia. So you'll see outside we have a beach. And after this talk, we're actually gonna go up to the roof and we can hang out on the dance floor and dance a little bit. And then we have a, a nice hot tub we can hang out and have some conversations. So, okay, so let's start our talk here. So this is the book that I have on Amazon. It's called The True Definition of Beauty. Um, we were, it was very interesting in that um, we were very fortunate that uh, when it came out, uh, it got promoted and it reached number one on Amazon of all places, which was really exciting. Um, uh, it also reached, reached number one on Barnes and Noble. Um, so we were really excited about that as well. Uh, so people found this really interesting. And um, finally, on the Wall Street Journal, it reached a bestseller and it was me, Demi Moore, Malcolm Gladwell, um, and uh, we were just really excited to, um, I think, in Bill O'Reilly, we were in the top uh, 10 for this week when this book uh, was released. And so it got some notoriety and that was really exciting. I think, um, you know, when you're hearing people speak, I think it's really interesting to hear where they come from. Um, so I'm originally from the Northeast. Um, I went to college at Rutgers. Um, I actually uh, went to med school at the University of Pennsylvania. 
um, I did my medical school there. And then I did a fellowship in Oklahoma City with really the master of the use of lasers, a um, person named Sterling Baker. And that's where I got a lot of my skills uh, that I use today. I've been I've practiced about 23 years now. Um, I have a practice that's based in Tampa, but interestingly, we have people come from all over the world to our practice. Come on in, guys. Have a seat in the uh, one of the chairs, the open chairs there, and join in here our talk here. So I'll talk about why we have people come from Australia and New Zealand to our practice. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is this idea of nonverbal communication. There was a, a um, report, um, an article that came out by a colleague of mine, Judgment Jej Khan was his name. And he put together a paper calling Aesthetic Surgery, Diagnosing and Healing the Miscues of Human Facial Expression. And in that, um, he actually looked at this, at the face, and the face being an organ for communication. And um, what he realized is that the interpretation of facial messages is innate. So if someone is upset, we can actually tell that they're upset. You know, just our brain can process this immediately. And if someone's mad, we know that too. Um, so it's innate, this interpretation of facial messages. And sometimes through birth and sometimes through age, the face can change in a way where it's not consistent with the way that we feel inside. So most of the facial surgery is not necessarily vanity. It's not people thinking about how great they look, right? Um, so if people can mute themselves, that'd be great. So we don't hear things in the background. You just mute yourself, that'd be great. Um, and so it's not really about that. It's about cleaning up communication. So there was a, a colleague of mine, her name is Nancy Etzkoff. She's actually a PhD in Harvard. And she wrote a book called The, the Science of Beauty. She was looking in society and said, okay, what does beauty mean for the way that we exist in our society? And what she found is that um, even back in uh, ancient times, Aristotle, when he was asked why people desire physical beauty, he said, no one who's out blind can ask that question. And according to uh, Dr. Etkoff, you know, um, we evaluate each other all the time for these facial cues. Um, and so they notice like in a, um, in a nursery, the kids who are cute get picked up a little bit uh, sooner than the kids who are not as cute. And I think this is true. When we find someone to be attractive, we want to please them with no expectation of immediate, immediate reward or reciprocal gestures. Okay, going on. So what is the idea of beauty. So I think we've all heard it's the eye of the beholder, right? How many people have heard that? Give me a little clap or raise your hands if you've heard that, this eye of the beholder. That is part of it. Uh, but I want to talk about another part. And this has to do with mathematics. Um, it turns out that if I take you back to the 1200s in Pisa, Italy, Italy wasn't really Italy back then, it was these city states. In Pisa, there was a gentleman named Leonardo Fibonacci. And uh, he grew up in an upper middle class family. And interestingly, he uh, went over to Asia and to India and studied mathematics and came back to Pisa. And he used these mathematical concepts. He wrote, wrote a book called Gobert Abachi. Um, this is a picture of me. We actually made a trip uh, to Pisa some years ago. And my, my wife was very excited to see the Leaning Tower. I was very excited because they had a sculpture of uh, Leonardo there. Uh, that I took a picture next to. Leonardo, that's Leonardo Fibonacci from Pisa. Anyway, um, in, this book, in this book of Barabacci, he was looking at the multiplication of rabbits. Um, and he used this mathematical concept. And the, the numbers go as follows. He, it's 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, uh, 89. And what he found is that when you divide one number by the other number, it comes up with this ratio of 1 to 1.618. And what they noticed is that in nature, a lot of things in nature had this ratio. The internal parts of a flower to the external parts of a flower had this ratio of 1 to 1.618. And they found that um, with numeric sequences, you can find a curve. And that red curve that you see there, that's the curve of Fibonacci, also known as phi or the golden ratio. It matched the, the curve of the nautilus, which matched the, nautilus, the curve of the helix of the ear. Well... They use this all the time in the Renaissance. They, they found that when they had uh, people, uh, when they were creating art, like when they were doing Mona Lisa's face, uh, they use these ratios. When they were um, using the um, painting, or I'm sorry, when they painted Mona Lisa's face that way, when they painted the Last Supper, when they made the Parthenon, when they made Notre Dame, they used all these ratios. And they started to realize that this was really powerful. And 
uh, they actually can find faces the same way. So regardless of how a person's face um, looks like in terms of ethnicity, the more a patient a person's face has these ratios, the more attractive those faces are seen. So um, I want you to look at these pictures. This was actually a study done in Germany uh, in university, and they actually looked at they had 10,000 university students evaluate these photos and they had them change it each way so it would be more consistent with this golden ratio. And uh, if this was a PowerPoint slide, it would work a little bit better. But uh, if you look at it, five and six pretty much is what 100% of people picked when they said who were the, what were the best photos that they thought they saw. Is that interesting? Can you see that yourselves? Clap if you can see that yourself or raise your hand there if you can see that. Okay. Oh, I like it. Nice. <laughs> Okay, so the other part of beauty is not just mathematics, but it has to do with um, our icons, right? So the media has this roving eye and shows us icons that we are influenced by. So by looking at our icons, we get ideas in terms of beauty. In terms of human, female beauty, look at um, here, Julia Roberts. She has a lot of the classic features of, of female beauty. She has a large, smooth forehead. She has a small nose. So the, the nose, because it seems smaller, the eyes seem farther apart. She has a glowing shape to her brow and a more tapered jawline. Now, if we contrast that here, turn here, and we look at Brad Pitt, he himself does not have a tapered brow, right? He has a straight ahead brow. His nose is bigger, so his eyes seem closer together. He has a more square jaw from chewing muscles known as masticatory muscles. And uh, let, me, let me change our slide here, excuse me. And here, now I'm sorry they broke up, but uh, I think it's a good example. Here we have Angelina Jolie. She has a tapered brow and Brad Pitt has a more straight across brow. Her nose is smaller. So if you notice her eyes seem farther apart where his nose is bigger. So his eyes seem closer together. She has a more tapered jawline and he has a more square jawline. And I wanna show you now, this is an interesting uh, picture. So look at these two photos here, okay? Um, now, when you look at those, which one looks like the man and which one looks like the woman? So I'm gonna say, if you think the right one looks like the man, can you clap or raise your hand there? If you think the right one looks like uh, likes the man, yeah. And the left one looks like the woman. Now, I think you'll notice that your brain sees that automatically. Isn't that interesting? You don't have to think about it. You're like, that's the woman. Well, it turns out interestingly, it's a picture of the same person. And what they did is they digitally darkened the lip region in the picture on the on the left and the eye region. They darkened those areas. And that is what your subconscious brain sees as female. It turns out that women inherently have more vascularity to their eyelid region and mouth region as compared to men. And that's part of the way our subconscious brain can see femininity versus masculinity. Men have more one color and uh, women tend to have more uh, two colors, you know, in terms of the pigment around their eye and mouth region. I thought that was very interesting. And here's Jessica Beale. And so women know about this and they'll put lipstick on their lips and uh, wear eyeshadow to highlight those areas to make them look even more feminine. The eyes are the window's soul. Um, and then we tend to look at the eyes and mouth kind of first. The central face is really important. There was actually um, a talk I heard by a, a person named Daniel Alam. He was a uh, facial plastic surgeon from Cleveland Clinic. He did one of the first tra um, face transplants on a woman, Connie Culp. Connie was married and uh, she got divorced and her estranged husband came to her, this is sad, but um, came to her door and shot her in the face with a shotgun. And um, he was talking about um, how important um, the central faces when he's doing face treatments. This is Connie. This is after 19 surgeries. And uh, interestingly, she had the first face tra transplant ever. And this is her after the face transplant. Okay. So I'm going to go back here. If you knew Connie before, okay, you would be friendly with Connie. You would say, oh, it's nice to see you again, this sort of thing. But for her to make new relationships was very, very difficult. And what happens, though, is that we are very social beings. We want to make new connections all the time. So this was after her face transplants. And he said the most important thing in doing the face bent is the eye and the mouth region. So now when she's out, people, it looks looks better, but it's still a little bit, you know, a little bit strange, but it looks better. And she can build relationships now. 
The question is, though, that when you have a transplant, transplants do not last forever. They last a certain number of years. And the anti-rejection medications they put people on will actually shorten a person's life. So the question is, if you're going to have a shorter life, would you take this, this, um, this change, basically? Um, and she did because sociability and us connecting as humans is so important. Okay. So look at the central part of the face. If you take our former president, Barack Obama, and you cut out that part of the face, and you put it onto a, another person, can you still see our former president there? I think you can. And do you know who is that? Who's behind that photo? I'll show you here, of course. Yes, Brad Pitt. Excellent. Um, so this patient actually came to see me, and she said that she felt very, very um, stern all the time. I did something, I'll talk about it later, but I changed something about her face. It was really the eyebrows I was able to raise, and she was seen as more um, approachable. <coughs> And so I think if you look here, remember that uh, curve I showed you of Fibonacci, you see that, that top of that curve, when I reestablished that curve there to the brow, it actually made her look more approachable. And Jamie Lee Curtis had this a great quote. She's an actress. She said, the first thing I look about look at a woman is her soul, and then I check her eyebrows. <laughs> so here by raising the eyebrows, it actually made her more approachable. And, it be and because it has that ratio, that's things, I think that's why our subconscious brain likes us better. Here is Rob Lowe back in the day and Brad Pitt. Um, and Rob Lowe was actually plucking his brows to give him a more feminine brow because you can see it's a more arched brow. There's more androgynous look. And Brad Pitt has a more classic male brook. So, you know, in society, we are very social beings and we love connecting uh, with each other. And um, our faces are a big part of our verbal communication with others. And what happens is when we speak with one another, okay, 7% is the words that I'm using, 38% is my verbal tone, and 85% is really the, um, the facial balance and the, the facial muscles that I'm using. Um, and what we found was um, when we see one another, the things that we see first are really the eyes and mouth, and then the facial skin and uh, boundaries or facial contours secondarily. And our subconscious brain uh, then tells our conscious brain, how do we feel what we be, about what we saw in those areas? And so I think that's really interesting, the science of this. So aging changes that happen around the eye and mouth can create an impression of being tired or less vibrant. I think you can see that in the photo. Um, and um, improvements, though, in our eyelid region, our skin and mouth can convey to other people positive effects. So simple things, women wearing uh, makeup, right, to their eyes or to the mouth can help with uh, those, the nonverbal communication in those areas. Wearing flattering glasses, right, um, can help that as well. Uh, sometimes, though, um, what we find is that with age, um, uh, makeup and glasses sometimes are not enough. And then will, people will come to see physicians like myself for help with their appearance to help them with, with these areas. Let's do a, a social impact. So this woman was actually a uh, professor. Her name is Erin. She was a professor in uh, a college in New York. And they would come to her and say, Ms. Erin, were you drinking last weekend? <laughs> Which was not very polite. But they saw that when her eyes had that appearance, they thought that it made her look like she was tired, right? Uh, those are called festoons. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And I helped her. So now she doesn't get that same impression. In fact, she was divorced and she was trying to date. And she found that that appearance she had before wasn't helping her as much. But now, you know, her appearance is much more appropriate for the way that she feels inside. Um, I was on a number of shows. This was when I was on The Doctors. Um, I brought Erin on and I was demonstrating actually how I can help that condition called festoons, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this uh, seminar. This is another woman, Donna. Uh, Donna had these uh, festoons as well. Um, I was actually on Dr. Oz's show as well. Uh, and I brought Donna on and uh, I showed him using an avocado, uh, how we use the lasers to help festoons. Um, and that was a very exciting to be on there. And this is Donna before and then after this procedure. And um, do you like that improvement there? Give me a little uh, clap there if you like that or a little thumb, thumbs up. Thank you, guys. Excellent. OK, moving on. Festoons. So what are they? They are these pouches that form on the cheek. Um, they can form in the lower lid area, in the eyelid area. Um, it's due to sun damage and contrasting muscle actions underneath the skin. 
um, and what we can do. I've actually put together a book chapter on this. Um, it's available actually on Amazon with my mentor, Sterling Baker, on how I treat lasers to help this. This is an example of treating festoons um, in the lower eyelid area. This is another example um, of treating festoons there. Okay. And so what's interesting now is that new um, research, as well as high-powered lawsuits, is alleging appearance-based discrimination. And uh, we thought this was really interesting um, that this is happening now. And they're looking how appearances hurt or help um, others. So the, the Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis, I thought they did more monetary policy, but they actually did a study based on appearance. And what they found is that when you had someone with average appearance and someone with below average appearance, the one with below average appearance earned about 9% less. And those with above average appearance are in about 5% more, or this was about a 14% swing in these areas. I think it's something that we think about intrinsically that's possible, but it's something that's real, that is really happening out there. And so when we make an improvement, this really helps. I have this book, The True Definition of Beauty. Um, oh. I'm sorry if I, I went off there for a little bit. Um, okay. So I don't know if, let me see if I can go back here. I was, I was actually talking about how um, this area where they did a study looking at the link between appearance and wages. Um, and what we found is those people with uh, above average appearance are about 5% uh, more and below average about 9% less, 14% swing in those areas. So I was asked by the New York Post, based on my book, to evaluate the candidates for mayor for two mayor's races ago. And we did that. And uh, they they published the results. And I didn't realize everybody who read that, but uh, Howard Stern saw that. And he actually reached out to my people and said, hey, will he come on the show and actually evaluate our faces and how we interpret? So I'm going to walk over here to the other part of this uh, room. And we're going to play this video here. And here's here, what he had to say. Well, it says here, Howard needs nothing. He's so handsome. Oh. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> uh, let's see. Loss of facial volume. Like Fred, you need to fill in all those heavy. I have those huge lines. Like, I know. You yeah, always how, talk Howard, about them. Would, I, I mean, know. honestly, it's a real loss of volume. Howard, for you, what I was saying. Yeah, really, people can mute themselves. The That'd be great. Area, I was saying if you could, if you could, it would be surgery. OK, but if Go you ahead. could do surgery for the eyelids, I do that stuff with lasers. Lays the eyelids? Mm -hmm, the upper eyelids. And then if we could add volume back to the lower face, there's actually a product. This isn't surgery, mind you. There's a product called Sculptra. And what it is, it's a product we use as a facial filler. It takes a while to work, but once it's set up, it lasts years. You would be a great candidate for that, Howard, because if you could add volume to that area, you look at your after, it's really, I mean, you look like you, but it's just, I, I look like, like gorgeous. You look like a softer you. I look, <laughs> yeah, a, a better me. Yeah. Now, Doc, is any of this stuff, to, when, when I hear women are injecting rat poison into their face, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's basically what, I, 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 I don't get, like, I'm not doing anything. I mean, what's the difference at this point? I'm a mess. You know what I mean? But. <laughs> You know, it's just, yeah, it's just personal. It's something you want to do. I'm just saying there are options for people if they want to do these things. You're yeah. saying you get rid of all that shit on my face like that in the after picture? Is that accurate? Yeah, I think, I mean, really the volume. Yeah, if you had, the volume is the most powerful thing for you. Volume. In other words, what do you stick in my face to give me volume? There's a, uh, there's a product called Sculptra. And what it is is a, there's a suture material that if we people use in surgery. They make mics, collagen, uh, and they, it, yeah. they take mm. advantage of this. And they make it into little tiny bits. They put it in the face. And then the body will build its own collagen around these products. Really? Wow. Yeah. They, and it, How long does that take? It, I mean, it takes about an hour to do. Um, what happens, actually, I have, I have newscasters who I do this for in my area on the, on the evening news. And I like this because you look better gradually. What happens is you get the result. It goes down. You get a view of what it looks like. It goes down in about two days because the water resorbs. And then the particles that are left over about eight weeks, the body responds to and builds collagen all right. over the place. Wow. And so each week you get better and look better and better and better. Imagine and how so, gorgeous I'd be. I'm a 10. And then when it start, does it start to go bad again? Oh, so yeah. It's that, like... You know what it's like? It's like um, Charlie. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like he, he was retarded. And then in the book, Flowers for Algernon, he becomes a genius and then he slowly starts becoming retarded <laughs> again. and that's the bitch hey, Howard, <laughs> i gotta admit dr like shiner's that. after picture does look way better on me but uh you know hey i don't know then you gotta go do all this stuff uh, dr shiner give yourself a plug here or i'll give it to you for more information on dr adam shiner's practice go to adamshinermd.com hey thanks dr shiner hey it's been a pleasure Thank pleasure you. bye bye take care
You know, a lot to well, consider. now we know there's something we can do. <laughs> I thought it was hopeless. I would say, without a doubt, 100 percent of the people in Hollywood have something going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what? how they stay there's looking too, good. There's too much at stake. They, yeah. they, they're they're you know they're at the big game. Absolutely. That's you know, it's the same thing. It's like baseball players do steroids. Both people do Botox. Well, maybe we got to go visit Dr. Shiner. <laughs> I think that's what you're saying. Hey, well. I hope you found that interesting there. Let me get back into my place here, go back to our talk. That was really uh, fun being on his show. I, I was kind of nervous about all the things that, oh. okay. So going back, go, go back to our show now. Let's see, um, and mute. Come back to our lecture here. So um, that was interesting actually being on the show. I was nervous because of uh, all the things that he tends to do with guests, but they were so into their own photos. It made a big difference there. Uh, he was just so interested in his own photos. Here's another uh, impact uh, a study about nonverbal communication. This guy was a, actually a federal judge, and people were coming there and they said, you know, your honor looks like you, you look really tired. Uh, you want to go back to your, your chambers. And uh, he said, you know, I don't really want to get come across to other people like that. And so I did surgery to help him, um, and now he looks uh, more refreshed. Well, this was an interesting story because he was married and he is in his, in his 70s. And then uh, what happened is they was out socially, and this is his wife, and people come up to him and say, Your Honor, very nice to meet you. Can you introduce me to your mom? <laughs> and uh, I would say women really want to be the uh, not really known as the mother, but really the attractive partner of the person they're with. So uh, she came to me and I said, You know, I think I can help you. Um, so I did something to help her, and now she looks like she's in her 50s too. So now they're both in their 70s, but they're a nice matching pair there. So that was kind of neat. Moving on, this gentleman uh, um, as well, he was a therapist and you can see the difference of how his clients were telling me he looked tired all the time. And by making an improvement in the eye area, he now looks a little more approachable, a little more awake. So as we age, there's three parts. There's skin deterioration, facial deflation, descent of the eyelids. Uh, the skin I want to talk about is really our largest organ. We don't think about necessarily our skin being an organ. We think about the liver being an organ, the lungs, but actually our skin is our biggest organ. And the skin has a job. Its job is protection. It protects us from infection. Uh, it's a fluid barrier. It's biggest organ for sensory input. It makes vitamin D in the sunshine. There are two main parts of the uh, skin. There's the epidermis, which is the top layer, and the dermis, which is the bottom layer. The bottom part of the epidermis, that top layer, there's, a, there's sort of a purple layer there. That's the basal cell layer. If that cell is healthy, all the cells above it are healthy. If that cell is not healthy, the cells above it are not healthy. In the dermis, we have elastic fibers, collagen fibers, and uh, hair follicles. So why does our skin age? There's intrinsic aging due to genetics, but the main thing is photo aging. And sun protection is the best way to protect this. So sun protection is the single best way to protect against skin aging because everything we know about age spots is due to sun exposure. When the sun comes down on the earth, it's comprised of multiple wavelengths of light. There's visible, uh, there's visible rays that allow us to see one another, okay? And then there are invisible rays called ultraviolet rays. And the most important of these are actually the ultraviolet uh, a, B, and C. UVC is actually toxic to life, uh, and uh, it's really absorbed by the ozone primarily. UVB, it's in yellow there, goes through the uh, epidermis, a little bit into the dermis there. Um, it creates our skin to be burned, B for burn. And UVA is a really damaging one. The UVA is A for aging. It goes all the way through the epidermis into the dermis where it fractures collagen elastic fibers, allowing the skin to sag and droop. And um, it can actually penetrate uh, clouds and car windows. So it's a really powerful wavelength. Um, so SPF is refers to sun protection factor. We want it something that's broad spectrum and water resistant. That's really what we need nowadays. That'll protect us against both UVA and UVB, which is what we need. And every time that we're wearing um, sunblock, it actually protects us because every moment we're in the sun, we get a little bit of damage. So if you could wear sunblock every day on your hands, on your neck, your face, you'll actually slow down what the sun does in terms of aging us. This picture here, um, she looks like she's 100. She's, uh, I think, 58. Um, and then he is 78. His skin looks better. And this is really the difference of sun damage over time. This woman actually had a, uh, the story I heard, she had a 
she worked in a corporate building and she had a corner office and the sun would warm her cheek every day. And that's why her cheeks look different. One side was getting all the full UVA from the sun because that makes it through windows. Um, moving on here. This was actually an Australian truck driver. And you see his face looks different because the sun was hitting one side of the face more than the other. And um, I actually did a, a picture analysis. And if we split the face, this is a falsified picture. But if he wore sunblock, you could see the difference if he wore sunblock as opposed to when he was in the sun all the, all the time. So how do you repair sun damage? Well, there's something, there's medical uh, uh, components such as tretinoin that can actually help, help the skin. Uh, there are light treatments that we use um, and laser that we can use as well. This is just um, medical skin care where we can help with pigmentation on the cheek region, um, on, the, on the cheek as well. This woman had hyperpigmentation or dark pigment around her lip and chin. You can see how it was improved with just medical skin care, home skin care, but medical skin care. Same thing here with this woman with her sun-kissed cheeks and how we're gonna make that uh, smoother with the uh, medical skin care. Lasers is the way that I really use um, to improve skin. I can use lasers and I can get rid of pigment and get new collagen to form. Um, I can use this uh, in the upper lip area, like she has here, all those upper lip lines, and we're able to make that improved. Here, this older woman, the same thing. You see the cheek and the upper lip and how that's improved um, with this laser. Um, she looks like a younger version of herself, we say, almost like her younger sister. This was interesting. I've been doing this for many years. Um, I've been practicing for 23 years, and I knew that I was making skin look better, but I didn't realize what else I was doing. And so this woman had surgery with me some years before, I worked on her upper lids to raise them and I worked on the lower lid bags and then I used laser on their skin to make the skin cleaner. She came back to me two years later, she was erupting in skin lesions all over her face, except for, if you look at it, the area underneath her eyes. <laughs> that was actually the best looking skin in her face. And this taught me that when I did this procedure two years later, not only was I getting rid of the lines and wrinkles, I actually made the skin healthier. I then treated the rest of her face. And um, this taught me that I can actually make the skin healthier and look better at the same time. So I love this treatment because not everyone has protected their skin their entire lives. Um, and let me show you here. So here's an example. This one was sent by her dermatologist, right? Uh, it looks almost unbelievable. I would, I would think if you say that, that really looks false, doesn't it? If you think that it looks false, uh, you know, raise your hands or clap your hands. Yeah, I think it looks false, but it's real. That's a real case. Uh, we did surgery to help her uh, lower lids and upper lids, and then we made the skin better. Um, here's another one. And once again, you say, well, this can't be the same person. It is absolutely the same person. This is the power of using lasers in the proper way to make the skin look better and healthier at the same time. Um, here's another, this is the same person looking uh, straight at us. And you can see the difference in the pigmentation and the bags under the eyes that we took care of. We do it for men too. And we often say that this almost looks like his younger brother. It's almost like the older brother on the left and younger brother on the right. Once again, older brother on the left, younger brother on the right. So we think that it looks like the same person. It just looks like a healthier version of that person. Uh, this woman, interestingly, she told me that she said, the words that she used, she said, I feel invisible. She would go to stores and people were not even um, uh, checking on her. Okay, They weren't even relating to her. The whole world is relating, which is sad. The whole world is relating to her differently now. She actually had her first date in 20 years, which I thought was just so, so special. And I love helping people this way. Okay. And this is another example. Look at the quality of skin here. Look really closely. Can you see the difference in the pigmentation there and in the lines in the face? And some people say, that, well, this cannot be true. This is absolutely true. This is actually the skin that, and what it looks like after healing, after this procedure, this reset procedure that I do for sun damage, you know, makes it look like her younger sister, I would say. Interestingly, I can use lasers in other ways too. People have moles on the face and sometimes uh, the moles are almost like uh, the tip of the iceberg. They go all the way through the skin. If it's dangerous, you do have to cut it out. And if you cut it out, this scar is three times as long as the actual lesion. But if it's not dangerous, the question is, would you want to trade you know, a facial lesion for a scar? And most people would not. Dermatologists will sometimes shave them off, but unfortunately with a blade, you can't be very precise. So what we find sometimes is that people will actually um, uh, 
have this done and they'll end up with a scoop where the lesion may still be present there. So what I do is I can use a laser actually to plane down these moles. And you can see here um, in the, uh, around the nose, you can see those uh, lesions in the nose region, uh, around the nose, the, the, the helix of the nose there. Let me move back here so you guys can see better. Let me turn here. And uh, here's another example straight on with those moles on the nose, almost like they're not there. So they're still there, but we plane them down so you don't see them anymore. And I thought that was, this is a very exciting uh, way that I learned to help people. This gentleman had a, a, a mole that he would shave and would he would cut it when he would shave his sideburns. And we can help that like that, help patients like that. Deflation of the face. So we tend to lose volume as we age. We have this triangle of youth that we have when we're young. And then as we get older, um, it turns into more of a boxy appearance. So here we can see Rita Hayworth over time becomes more boxy. It's almost like we have like an inflated beach ball. And then as we deflate, we lose volume, our face ages. Looking at this uh, tulip, if you can look here, um, what is the difference between this tulip and this tulip? What is it missing? And I don't mind if you, you can comment here. If I, you want to turn on your mic, you can tell me what you think. Why is, what's missing here? Why is one tulip uh, erect and one drooping? What's the difference? Anybody? Okay, well, I'll tell you. Actually, the it's water, missing. the water has been lost, and that's why it's drooping. And our faces are actually the same way. When you lose volume, that causes us to age. So we can actually use um, uh, volume to straighten jaw lines. Um, we can use it to straighten a jawline or the lower mouth areas. This woman, her name is Peggy. She called that her older bitchy face because people thought she was mad all the time. And by changing the volume, you can see it's amazing what that looks like. Now, people are really nervous about this because the, the, the people in Hollywood, I don't know who they go to, but they have weird results in the cheeks, um, in the lip area there. Um, I will tell you, so this woman, about how many years older does she appear to you here from the, in the picture there? Can you, um, you can... Uh, unmute yourself and give me a comment. How much older does she look? About. About. Anybody? Okay. Uh, someone just About 10 years video. older. Okay. Yeah. I'd say about 10 years older. Interestingly, she's three years late older here. We've been working on her skin and her volume. So she's looking younger as she's getting older. Winding up here, we actually lose volume in multiple areas. Look at this area around the um, around the ear, and then look at th this patient. This interesting photo because this woman had had some cosmetic services, but I think it looks awkward, doesn't it? It's almost like you look at her face, and it's got big cheeks, big lips, but there's hollowing in the temples and in the jawline. It looks almost masculine at the same time. And by paying attention to to those facial ratios, so we can fill out the the temples and the cheeks and the, and the whole face, that makes things more, more balanced. We do it for men as well, here like in the cheek region and the temple region. This woman as well, she's in her 50s, and you can see how filling out that area around the temple uh, makes, it, makes an improvement. We can do this for noses too. We actually can inject noses and make noses look straighter uh, without surgery. And this is kind of amazing. We use fillers. This woman actually had a bad nose job years ago, it was crooked. And if you can see the line of light that goes down the nose, we actually filled in the, uh, in on, looking on your view, it's the right side of the picture on the nose. It's really her left part of her nose. And then we create this light line that goes down the nose. You notice in the picture on the left, your brain sees the nose. On the picture on the right, you ignore the nose and see the eyes and mouth. And that's what it's about, making things more harmonious with the face. This is her straight on. That light line makes the nose look straighter. I've done this for both Asian noses and uh, African-American noses, and it tricks the brain as seeing the nose is more narrow. I think it's really interesting. Scent of the eyelids. This is the last thing I want to talk about. So we can have heaviness to the eyelids and the upper lids and lower lids. This gentleman you know, looks more youthful when that's in improved. This woman had low eyelids and her her uh, bridge partners told her that she should go back to bed because she looked she was tired. She didn't want that. So by raising the eyelids, and take care of the fullness underneath, underneath her eyelids and made her look much more awake. Same with this gentleman, the fullness that he had under the eyes um, made him look a little more tired. Uh, Asians as well. Um, Asians, we want to make sure to protect their normal crease, their eyelid, not to make them look too wide. We do that as well. 
We do brow lifts too using um, incisions. We can actually work in the scalp and raise eyebrows and fix lower lids at the same time. That's an example of this case. And this was actually a Botox brow lift I was showing you before. There are ways to, to actually weaken muscles that actually bring the brow down. And uh, by weakening those muscles, the brow can raise up. And so using Botox, we can actually cause the brows to raise up. When she would smile before, her eyes looked like they would shut. And notice in this photo, when she smiles, her brows stay elevated. So <clears throat> actually, I teach Botox and fillers um, to other practitioners who want to learn. And I think this is interesting that we can use it in this way to actually raise a brow. Um, my book is available on Amazon. And... Um, uh, you know, you're welcome to download it, The True Definition of Beauty. It's really interesting. This is the end of the, the talk. Um, I want to tell you, for you coming in here, I'm really I'm really excited you guys came. Um, there's a QR code here, and on the right side, there's a QR code there. If you click that, it'll bring you to um, a screen. I think you can even do it while you're here. It'll, bring, it'll open another tab in your computer, and you can book a consult to talk with one of my sales associates. If you do that between now and noon tomorrow, and you mention the code True Definition 2022, they will give you a thousand dollars off any procedure you decide to have, which I think is pretty nice. And it's a, uh, it's what I'm giving you guys for being here in this um, in this seminar. After noon time tomorrow until Monday, it's going to drop to about five hundred dollars um, after that time. But between now and noon on Friday, you can get that higher higher balance. And I want to thank you guys so much. Um, so I will open up for questions uh, from people. So if you want to un unmute yourself and ask questions, I'm happy to answer any questions for you guys. Go ahead. Go ahead. Anybody? Bueller? Ferris Bueller? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, well, if you guys want at this point, well, we could, does anyone have a question? I can hear a little echo there. That someone might be uh, wanting to ask a question. Are you a candidate for this surgery if you have filler under your eye? Say it one more time. Are you a candidate for this surgery if, you're, uh, if you have filler under your eye? Yes, um, what we usually do is dis dissolve the filler first, and then we can do a surgery under the eyes after that. That's a great question. A lot of people put fillers under the eyes um, as an effort to try and camouflage fullness there. Some people think it looks hollow because they're looking at the hollow underneath the fullness, and it can be full or hollow depending on where your attention is. Um, we find that surgery is a better way to address that as opposed to fillers. But that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking that. Dr. Shiner, do you have an age limit for your surgeries? Ask that one more time. I'm sorry, there's kind of active. If people can mute themselves if you're not asking a question and unmute if you're asking a question. Dr. Shiner, do you have an age limit to do your reset procedure? hard for me to hear you. I'm sorry. Do you have an age limit for your reset procedure? Oh, an age limit. That's excellent. Thank you for asking that. Um, it turns out that we can do this at any age. There are some people who are young in their 20s, 30s who have acne scars that, that we can help. And then there are people um, who've had sun damage over their lives. And I love this because I can make the skin look better, which is nice, but healthier too, so they don't have to visit the dermatologist as much in the future. That was a great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I tell you what now, if you follow me, what I think we'll do, let's go up to the upstairs of this penthouse and we actually have a dance floor there and uh, we have in addition uh, a, a hot tub and we can hang out there and you can ask me questions individually so if you will follow me I don't think I have the host tools can't have them follow me okay 
So we'll just, if you follow me here, out this way, we're going to end up upstairs. I'll stop here and I'll turn around. Come and follow me, everybody. Come into the main room here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go around the bedroom. Oh, we meet here in the bedroom for a moment. Excellent, guys. And there's another place if you want to click that link for the webinar, you can. You can come back down there. This is open anytime, so you can come on up. And then let's come on up, up the stairs. And I put some music on, so if you want to dance, you can. If you use on the keyboard, on the keyboard, on the keyboard, on the keyboard, number one, two, or three, one, two, or three, oh, sorry, three, four, or five, three, four, or five, you can do some dancing. There we go. Nice. We go. Nice. Nice moves, everybody. Nice moves, everybody. I'm going to churn the butter here. Churn the butter here. You like the music? You like the music? You like the music? You like the music? Okay, let's go over to the hot tub. You guys look great here. You guys look great here. <laughs> and uh, Gary, we're going to stop the broadcast. We're going to stop the broadcast.